chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 21 through 28 as we continue our series we just began here in the uh, Gospel of Mark. So I'll begin reading at verse uh, 21. I'll read to verse 28. We'll get into our study. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, reading to verse 28. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. And so let me once again give you some context and we'll move into our study. Mark began his presentation of his gospel by first revealing to us who Jesus Christ is. He began by saying Jesus is the Son of God. And he, he began to paint a picture for us. He, he is one of the prophets. Uh, he is one, rather, that the prophets wrote about, the prophets Malachi and Isaiah. He's the one that is the anointed Messiah. He is the one that resisted and overcame the temptations of the enemy. And so as we've seen, he was being presented in this way, and then we began to see his ministry. Jesus came, and he came with a simple and direct message. And, and the message was very simple, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, trust in the, the message of redemption. Now, the message of redemption, when truly believed, produces what is called a transformed life. This is the message that God intends for all generations to hear. Because of this, Jesus began selecting men in order that he might entrust his message to these men. And as we've already seen, Jesus has uh, selected four men to come and to follow him. He said to Simon and Andrew, James and John, he said, follow me. I will make you to become fishers of men. And the response, as we saw, on the part of these four was immediate. They left their nets, they followed him, and they didn't make any excuses, and there was no delay. And so the thought behind that is obvious. When God calls us, we need to respond. We need to respond immediately. We see that in the Scriptures. I was thinking of this as I was preparing our study. You see this immediate response in the life of Abram, who was later to be known as Abraham. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. But notice with me that he went forth immediately, as the Lord had said. You see that in the life of the apostle Paul. It's been said that Paul's conversion to Christ is the most famous conversion in history. We know that in Acts chapter 9, Paul had been authorized by the high priest to arrest the followers of Jesus Christ, and he was on the road to Damascus. And as, as he was on the road to Damascus, Jesus arrested him, and his encounter with the Lord left him blind. And when that happened, he was told that he was to go to the house of a man by the name of Ananias in Damascus. And he did, and when he went there, Ananias prayed for him, and Saul was healed of his blindness. The transformation was immediate. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. There was no delay with these men. They left everything to follow Jesus Christ. In these men's cases, these fishermen, they were leaving a profitable business. 
Now that reminds me of another man who was called, a man by the name of Matthew, a wealthy tax collector. Matthew 2.14 says, as he, as Jesus passed by, he saw Levi, Matthew, he was wearing a pair of Levi's, and the son of Alphaeus, he was sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose, and he followed him. And so the call of Jesus Christ, the call was, was specific. He was assembling his apostles. But the call can also be general because he calls people everywhere to follow after him. In Luke 9, 23, it says, He said to them, All, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross daily, and follow me. Now, some refuse. Some refuse to follow the Lord Jesus Christ because they consider all that they may be giving up. But instead, instead of thinking all that I'm giving up, we ought to be thinking all that we're going to gain in the Lord. In John 12, 26, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Well, in the case of James and John, it included leaving their father Zebedee. They were willing to leave everything, and they put Jesus Christ first. Now, at this time, they wouldn't have understood clearly what they're going to gain. But later, Jesus in Matthew 19, 29 said, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. There are a lot of people in this fellowship who, who left everything. They left their family behind, their moms and their dads. And, and they followed the Lord. They left it behind. It wasn't so much that they have no relation with them anymore, but they made a choice. I'm going to make something more important to me. I'm going to follow the king. As a result of that, they entered into fellowship with Jesus. And they entered into a family of those who are like-minded, people who follow Christ also. It's, it's really true, at least it's been in my life, that there are people that I have developed relationship in the Lord that have been as close as any brother or any sister has ever been. And so when you leave everything, it's not that you're losing everything, it's that you're gaining everything. And a lot of people don't understand that because they're thinking in a material sense. They're thinking of things that, that don't last. The things that do matter are the things that are eternal, and those things come through Christ. You see, every believer has gained something, and sometimes they don't even value what they've gained. Jesus called these men to follow him, and now as we enter into this portion of Scripture, we see Jesus demonstrating authority. He's going to demonstrate his spiritual authority as he teaches the word of God, but he's also going to show his authority as he casts out a demon. And in these verses, we see a contrast, a contrast between how people react and how demons react. The people are amazed. They're interested. They're intrigued at the manner in which Jesus is teaching. But on the other hand, the demons are aware of who he is, and they're terrified. The people are curious, but the demons react loudly to who he is. You see, they know who Jesus is. They know he's their judge, but the people at this point do not. And so in verse 21, again, it says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And... They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Jesus is in the north. If you look at your Bible map or if you've ever, ever been to Israel, he's in a region called uh, Galilee. It's the Galilee. He's in Capernaum. Capernaum is a, a city that's located on the northwest coastline of the Sea of Galilee. It was prosperous. It was a fishing village. It was located on a major highway, the major highway from the west to the east. And when you look at the city of Capernaum, I'll give you a little more detail as we develop this, the word Capernaum is translated the village of Naum. Now, this may be a reference to it being the hometown of an Old Testament prophet by the name of Naum. The word Naum is translated consolation or compassion. So some commentators think that this refers to the character of the villagers, that they were very compassionate as a village. But it could also give us insight into Jesus and his 
compassionate ministry. In the same chapter, Mark chapter 1, look at verse 40 and 41 with me for just a moment. It says, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Notice verse 41. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And so Jesus Christ is compassionate. He's in a village that is known for compassion. And as he's there, we know that this particular village is housing the compassionate one, the one who lives in the village of compassion. Now, Capernaum was where Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John lived. In Matthew 4, 13 through 16, it says that Capernaum became his headquarters after he was rejected in the city of Nazareth. And so there he is in Capernaum. Verse 21 says immediately he, he had immediately entered the synagogue and taught. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of information that might help you in the future. The word synagogue. The word synagogue spe speaks of a place of gathering. The practice of, of going to synagogue began during what is called the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians had destroyed and ransacked the temple in Israel in 586 B.C. So while in Babylon, the Jews began to gather for religious meetings in what are called synagogues. The temple remained the center of Jewish life, but many Jews lived many miles away. So synagogue was, was a place of worship. It was a place of study, community, fellowship. It even was a place where legal matters were determined. A synagogue could be formed anywhere that there were at least 10 Jewish men. So over time, synagogues became very important in Jewish community life. It, it served as a public school for boys where they studied the, uh, the Talmud, which is the oral tradition of Moses' law, as well as writing, reading, and arithmetic. And, and for men, it was a center of advanced theological training. And so Jesus is there in synagogue, and in verse 21, Mark tells us that immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue. Now notice, and he taught. And so there was something that was called the freedom of the synagogue. This made it possible for any qualified man to deliver a teaching from the Old Testament. And this freedom was extended to visiting rabbis. And, and Jesus had become well known, and therefore they invited him to speak there. In, in Luke 4, verses 14 and 15, it says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so teaching God's word was part of the ministry that Jesus performed amongst the people. His ministry is revealed, and we're going to see this in some detail. I'm laying foundations for you right now. But his ministry was revealed by teaching, preaching, and healing. In Matthew 4.23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So when he was preaching and teaching and healing, those are the three elements of the ministry of Christ that you, you see outlined in Scripture. When you're preaching, the, the, uh, the ministry of preaching is an appeal to the will. When someone is preaching the gospel, they are appealing to your will by the power of the Holy Spirit to make a decision. So when somebody is preaching... And, and, and speaking in a preaching way, what I, what I am doing when I preach, when a person preaches, is we're appealing to you to make a decision. So preaching has that evangelistic feel to it. Now teaching is giving you information that you're supposed to assimilate, that's supposed to be practiced so you can be transformed. So you preach the gospel, people get saved, then you teach them the ways of the Lord. So preaching and teaching are part of what Jesus did. And healing was the demonstration that the kingdom of God was amongst men. And that in the kingdom of God, God, who, is, who, is, who has no disease, is the one who removes your diseases. And so when Jesus was doing his preaching and teaching and his healing, that was the aspect of Messiah being amongst man. And that's what's going on. And so the reason he was teaching was so that people might know who he was. And he would teach the Old Testament because the word of God is pointing to him. Now, Mark had already made this clear when he had introduced uh, Jesus Christ to us in chapter 1. He had quoted the Old Testament books of Malachi and Isaiah, these two prophets. So that was something that was of utmost importance. It, it's, it's God's word that points to Jesus Christ. Now, in John 5, 39, it says, Search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. One of the things 
that I have great concern for in the life of the church in the 21st century. And some of you may not have the same concerns that I do, and understandably so. But the bottom line is, is there are, is if there's anything in terms of what I see as a famine in the land, it's a famine for the word of God. The church, not every church, but in many places has become an entertainment center where people choose to go to church, not necessarily to have the word taught to them, but in order that they might get a spiritual vitamin of some sort. And sometimes what happens is if you don't spur them enough emotionally, people get bored and they look for something else. Now, in an age that we have today where you have instant gratification, it's, it's an interesting challenge to deal with. You know, we live in such an instant world. I mean, right now you have in your pocket a computer called a phone that is amazing. I mean, it, it takes pictures. A lot of people seem to like to take pictures of themselves, that takes pictures, it records, it, it, you send messages, it's, it's everything plus a phone. And that's very interesting to me. If you were to go, even in my history, I was in, in uh, Europe in, in 1975, the first time I ever went to Europe, and uh, I would call Marie, my wife, they, they had something called collect. Some of you old people know what that means. Will you accept the charges? And we were dating at that time in early 75, and, and I would call her from Europe. And so she was working overtime to hear my beautiful voice. And, um, but uh, I would actually, you would call down to the front desk from your room, and you would say, I would like to make a collect call to the United States. And they would say, okay, what's the number? And all of that, they'd get your information. And then they would call you when they made the connection. And it could be 15, 20 minutes. It could be an hour or longer. So I would have to sit there waiting. And then finally, they'd ring, the, you know, ring up my room. I'd answer the phone. They'd say, we have your, your party on the line. And then you talk. Now, today, that, that's just, are you kidding me? I'm going to wait a whole hour to talk to her? I'll write her a letter. No, we used to have something called letters. Yeah, you know, I need help. Come quickly. Six weeks later, help shows up, right? I mean, that was your letter. So all the things that we have today are, are just, it's caused people to, to not realize the value of time and, and, and things. It, it's compressed things. And so if I don't instantly have something, it's not worth having. You know, so we pray, God, give me patience now because we want instant gratification I met her, I want her, I'll marry her tomorrow. That's kind of how we think. And so when Jesus was teaching, it actually took time for people to hear, to listen, to process, to decide. And so today, it, when we as a church, when we gather very often, if it doesn't keep my attention every second, then I'll find a place that does. Well, with Jesus, he would walk, he would spend time, we would minister, he gave the word of God. And, and as he was doing so, he was pointing out something to them. He was saying to them, you search the scriptures, you ransack. The word search means to ransack. You tear it upside down. Uh, police officers will tell you when somebody ransacks a room, it doesn't mean they just walked in. It means all the drawers and the dressers are turned over, the mattress is turned over, they look at it, they ransacked it. They go through the entire room. And Jesus was using that word when he says, you ransack the scriptures, for in them you think that, uh, that you have eternal life, and these are they which speak of me. You're ransacking but missing. And so Jesus would teach the word of God, and they were supposed to be able to see that it was him that the, that the prophets had spoken about. Because it's God's word, when it's rightly divided and taught and proclaimed, it's, it's God's word that brings people to salvation. It isn't somebody's testimony, and it's not a great musical score. It isn't a great vocalist. It isn't a great uh, uh, a guy who can play the instrument. Wow, those things are wonderful, and I'm blessed by God that we've been blessed by so many years in, over the years with so many who have that. But it's always been the word of God. It's the word of God that transforms. It's the word of God that informs. And this is what Jesus would do. He would rightly divide and he would preach and, and teach that word. And, and people were coming to faith. And, and he didn't rely simply on the miracles 
uh, at all because the miracles would draw attention. Signs, wonders, and miracles and all of that are intended to be like, like, like uh, road maps. It's, it's like when you're driving here to church and you've never been here before and you're on the 60 freeway and you see the Ramona exit. You're following signs to get to a destination. When Jesus performed his signs, they were bringing these people to a destination. It was him. In John 5, 45 through 47, Jesus said, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Because his words were scripture. So in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so as Jesus is teaching, notice this again, it says in verse 22, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were astonished. The word astonished means uh, they were struck. They were struck with amazement. They were amazed at the way Jesus spoke to them because he was speaking to them with spiritual and moral authority, not like the religious leaders, the experts in the law called the scribes. The scribes were held in high honor in Jewish society. They were the authority on questions of faith and practice in the law of Moses. But the scribes would not exercise their own authority. They didn't give independent judgments. They actually quoted other rabbis as authorities. They didn't exercise personal authority. They would refer to the traditions. But Jesus, when he taught, he taught differently. His teaching was direct. It was personal. It was filled with heaven's authority. When you read Matthew chapter 5, and it has the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, when you, when you read Matthew chapter 5 and you begin to look at the things that Jesus uh, says there, he, he, he will say things like this. He will say, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. But I say unto you, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, you have heard it said of those of old, an eye for an eye. But I say unto you, you've heard it said of those of old, love your neighbor, but hate your enemies. But I say unto you, and that's how Jesus spoke. He was, he was, actually, he was actually giving a, a, a new sense of the, of the passage, not from saying, Rabbi, you know, Halal has said this, because that's how they would teach during that day. Rabbi Gamaliel has said this. It wasn't that way at all. He said, you have heard it said, because the Jews had this compilation of the law and its interpretation. So the scribes had memorized the traditional aspects of the law, and therefore, when they would speak, they would say, well, as it was said by Rabbi Shammai, but Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And this astounds them. These people have not heard a rabbi speak like this before. And it says it in verse 22, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And they're there listening to him as he's speaking with this kind of authority, and it causes them to wonder. His approach to teaching caused, caused a stir amongst the people. He wasn't quoting others. He presented himself as absolute authority. His authority came from heaven in John's gospel, in chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, he said, I haven't spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus spoke with an authority that scribes did not have because he was an eyewitness. He was from heaven. In John 3, 31 through 34, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. 
for God does not give the spirit by measure. And so Jesus spoke with authority, and as they're listening to him spiritually give to them teachings, they start to scratch their head, and they start saying, I've never heard anybody speak like this. And it's amazing them, but notice what happens. Not only did he have teaching authority, but notice in verse 23, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, he shrieked, he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you ever wondered what that demon sounded like? That would be kind of creepy, I think. How did he sound? Well, it's interesting because as it speaks here, when it says in verse 23, he cried out, that's, that's uh, the word cried out, it speaks of loud volume, but it also gives a connotation of a shrieking. It was eerie. It was frightening. So this demonized man cries out in recognition of who he is. He interrupts Jesus and shrieks at him. You might find this interesting, but the Old Testament doesn't give instances of demonic possession. It's in the New Testament that you begin to see these things. For example, in the book of Acts, in chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, Luke recorded uh, about a girl in Philippi who had the spirit of divination that Paul cast the demon out of. Her. In, in Acts 19, 11 through 16, it speaks of Paul delivering demonized people. And it speaks of the seven sons of Sceva in that passage where where these, uh, Sceva was a Jewish exorcist, and uh, his sons tried to cast a demon out of a demonized man, and, and they say, we adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And uh, the demon said, you know, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? It's one of the more interesting passages in Scripture, if you read it, Acts 19, because uh, the demon man chased these seven sons out of the room, and, and they were all naked running down the street, and that would have been quite funny, I have to tell you. But you see that in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see accounts of demons. And when they encountered Christ, they would reveal themselves in, in various ways. In this instance, the demon began to scream at the top of his lungs when he saw Jesus. Now, notice verse 23. Mark tells us that this man had an unclean spirit. The demon that was within him drove him to impurity to vulgarity, to a sexually filthy lifestyle. That's what an unclean spirit does. So as Jesus was teaching, this demonized man makes it known that there's a demon there. Notice in verse 23 how it says here that he had cried out. He said, let us alone. And, and when it says he cried out, that speaks of wonder that's mixed with fear. This is a, a, a cry that is being raised from the depth of his throat. The demon is using the man's vocal cords, which is interesting. You might want to note this. Apparently, demons go to church. Now, he's in a state of terror. Let us alone. What have we to do with you? Now, as a fallen angel, the demon is like Satan. He's foul. He rejects God's holy authority. And the demon recognizes Christ. He instantly makes it clear they have nothing in common. The demon is impure and provoked this man to a filthy life. He's the opposite of Jesus. He has nothing in common with him. Jesus is pure and would set him free to live a pure life. In Hebrews 7.26, it says it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who's holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus is the opposite of the demon. They have nothing in common. In John 14, verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. There's nothing within me that responds to anything he has to offer. So by way of application, as followers of Christ, we too are to have nothing in common with evil. Nothing in common. In, in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? We're not to have unholy alliances. If you're single and you're considering dating, the one you date is to be someone who loves the Lord. It's to be someone. I've had people say over the years, yeah, I date. I'm a missionary. I missionary date. And um, no, I, I've, I've said this before. I'll say it again. You know, it's easier if I were to stand on the edge of this platform here, it would be easier for you to pull me off than for me to pull you up. And yet we have people who say, oh, I go out with with these people because they're a lot of fun. And if you want to date an unbeliever, it gives you a good gut check as to where you stand with the Lord and how important your walk with Christ is. Because what in common does light have with darkness? What in common does God have with Satan? And what in common would God's people have with those who don't love the Lord in terms of dating and marrying? You have to be aware of these kinds of things. And so as this is taking place, notice in verse 24 that he calls him Jesus of Nazareth. Now, remember, Nazareth has a poor reputation. It's insignificant. So he uses the word Jesus of Nazareth as a word of disdain. He's actually showing Christ disrespect. And then he says, he says in verse 24, did you come to destroy us? Are you going to lock us up in eternal judgment now? You see, demons know that Jesus was sent to accomplish salvation, to set the prisoner free. In 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So he wanted to know if Jesus was about to do the work at that moment. And so the answer to that question is, yes, he's going to judge, but no, not now. And notice in verse 24, this is another thing that's, to me, very interesting. He says, I know who you are. Demons know exactly who Jesus Christ is. There's something that is called demon faith. It's found in James 2.19, where it says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Demon faith. They know who he is in a way that sometimes even believers are still growing to understand. But he knew he had great fear. He saw him. Are you going to judge us now? Is it time now? Is that what you're going to do? You see, when Satan rebelled, he drew some of the angels with him. In Revelation 12, we saw this in verse 4. It says that Satan uh, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So these fallen angels know who Jesus is. But knowing who he is is not sufficient to save. Knowing who Jesus is, being able to speak concerning him or give us facts related to him, to even quote scripture as Satan does himself in scripture, does not mean you're saved. There are a lot of people that I've encountered over the years who, who, who think that knowledge is saving them. Knowledge alone doesn't save you. The knowledge of who he is, demons have that. I know who you are. I know there's a judgment coming. They know that more than human beings because human beings will argue that there is no judgment coming. But demons know that there is. I had a guy, I've said this before, but he told me this. He said, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. He told me after church, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell, but all my friends are going to go with me and we'll party. And I said, you don't, have a, you don't have a clue what you're talking about, do you? You don't have a clue. You think that hell is a big party? Well, all my friends will be there. Is that a good thing? You think that going to hell and, and there's going to be a party? No, you, haven't, you don't know scripture. You need to listen to what God's word says. Demons understand. Have you come to destroy us? Is it time for our judgment? And so Jesus comes with a message that sets people free, that sets the captive free. That's what he was sent to do. And in Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. God was with him. So he says, you are the Holy One of God. He's aware, the Holy One. He's aware of Jesus' divine authority. He greatly fears him. And the spirit that was energizing this possessed man was motivated to, to speak in this way. The voice behind the mask is exposed, and the people are seeing this. Now, picture this. This is like taking place in a church service, if you will, in a synagogue. And this eerie voice is speaking, and they had just been saying, this man has authority, and as they say that he's had, he has authority, there's this man there who is speaking out, 
Let us alone. What have we to do with you? There's a demon there in synagogue. He's in church, if you will. He's fully aware of Christ. And the spirit that energizes him is revealed. And the voice is revealed. Well, Jesus rebukes him. Notice verse 25. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Uh, there wasn't any holy water. There was no holy smoke. There was no ritual. There's no screaming. I don't know how many of you have ever seen uh, anything related to demons and all. When, when someone casts the demon out, you don't have to scream at them. You don't have to start sweating. You don't have to. All you need to know is the authority you have. It comes from Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I say unto you, come out. And you don't have to scream and you don't have to carry on. I've seen some dramatic versions of that where people get all emotionally caught up. Well, don't picture that in your mind when Jesus is speaking to him. Jesus looks at him and sternly says to him, come out of him. Just like that, come out of him. You have a guy shrieking in the tension and you can feel it. Somebody once asked me, how do you know when somebody is demonized? How do you know? And the, the, the best answer I've ever heard and the best answer that I I think I can give is this, it, it, you will know. There are times when people will say, well, how do you know? You will know. You will know. When you speak to somebody, as I have over the years, there are times when you speak to somebody who perhaps has some troubles, emotional problems, things like that. That's part of humanity. We, we experience that all the time. But I, I'll tell you, when you encounter a demon, <laughs> no, you know. You don't have to ask a question. I had a woman in my office many years ago who claimed to be demon-possessed. And she was sitting in my office. As a matter of fact, my then assistant, Dan Renshaw, was with me. He and I were together. And this woman sitting across from me in my office, a little teeny office, maybe 10 by 10. Dan was sitting here on the right, and I'm sitting here, and she's sitting in front of me. And so her friend had brought her in and said, she's demonized, or at least she's claiming to be. And so I looked at her, and I said, so do you want, to be, do you want it dealt with? And she said, yes. And I said, Okay, I said, let me pray, and we begin to pray. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just remembered this. I'd forgotten about it. We began to pray, and when we prayed, I'm, this mat's in my way. When we began, when I prayed, she put her hands up like claws, and she started to hiss, and she started to lunge out of her chair. And I pulled my hand back, man, you're going down. <laughs> I'm knock that demon out of your head. <laughs> it just shocked me. And my friend Dan jumps up, in the name of Jesus, very dramatic moment. Uh, he reminded me of that this, the other day. But she wasn't demonized. She was troubled. And, you know, I was a new pastor at that time, and, you know, I was in India later on doing ministry. And I encountered de a demon. And I can tell you, there is no question. You're not looking, wondering. You know this is a demon. I was with my friend Randy Walls. Randy and Dan will be with us tonight. I was with my friend Randy, and this person was across the street, probably 20 feet from us. And they turned and looked at us, and they were dragging this guy into a, into a Hindu temple. And we saw him dragging him down the street, and he was fighting, he turned and looked at us. And I literally, I've heard the phrase, your, your blood runs cold. I've heard that. That's a true phrase. It actually happened. My blood, from the top of my head, I could feel it in my feet. I go, oh, my goodness. I said, that guy's demonized. And I grabbed Randy and pushed him. <laughs> Get him, Randy. You can do it. No, you know, you know the sense of evil is so intense that it causes you to almost shake your head. And, and it's just a true story. If you ever encounter, you will know. Because I've had people ask me, how do you know? You'll know. You'll know. It's like all the evil you've been aware of in the world all your life is encapsulated in one moment. 
you know. And when this person began to shriek in synagogue, we know, are you going to? Can you imagine the people that were there when this took place? Could you imagine that? And they're watching Jesus. Now, he's been teaching with authority, and now they're going to see his spiritual authority. And so as this happens, notice what he does. He, he gives a command. Two of them, really, he says, be quiet and come out of him. So the first command silences the devil, and the second drove him out. We know who you are. You're Jesus of Nazareth. You're the Holy One of God. Jesus wanted no testimony from demons. He's not in league with the enemy. Because later he'd have an accusation concerning this. In, in Luke 11, 18 through 20, it says, if, if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, my, uh, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. They, he doesn't want to be joined or united in their mind with the enemy. So immediately it silences him. Now notice verse 26. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. The, the, the evil spirit could not resist harming this man one last time. He knew he had to leave, but he did so in a way to further injure him. Later in Mark, we see something similar when Jesus delivers a young boy. His father had brought this young boy to Jesus. Jesus delivered him, and in Mark 9, 26, it says, the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead so that many said he is dead. It, it seems to me that when the devil loses someone, he tries to injure them one last time. Some people, before they came to faith in Christ, made some of the worst decisions they've ever made just before they came to faith in Christ. Because I believe that the enemy to this day, in anticipation of what God can do because he's merciful and he saves, that he wants to injure you at least one last time. He wants to give to you one last kick, if you will, one last harmful thing. And you see it in Scripture that the, the demon convulses this boy uh, this guy, he convulses him, and then later this boy, to one last, one last harmful thing that he can do to him. And as this, this, this demon is, is, is removed, notice verse 27, they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Imagine what these people are thinking. It's like if they're in a church service, if you will. And all of this takes place. They're screaming. Jesus is identified. There's a stern command. There's a convulsion. There's deliverance. And then it's calm. And they're just sitting there, kind of like Wiley Coyote after he got blown up by TNT. Just standing, it's like, who is this? Who is this man? They're whispering amongst themselves, what is this? What new doctrine is this? His teaching already has awakened us to his spiritual and scriptural depth. We see that he has a command of God's word and insights we've never really heard before. But his work of delivering this one in bondage to Satan is even more amazing. Because even the things we fear most are subject to him. You ought to mark that down. Even the things we fear most are subject to him. What are you afraid of today? What is it that you're afraid of today? Even the things we fear most are subject to him. That's why we cast our cares on him. Why? 
because he cares for us. He is our deliverer. We need to understand that today. We need to understand that day. I'm quite serious about this. This is my main and closing point. Even the demons fear and tremble. And here we have believers who constantly are living in fear where God says, no, I am your peace. Be still. Know that I am God. Any time you ever see God afraid, that's probably time you should be afraid. But he doesn't get afraid. We're on a plane. We're having a difficult time. The masks that, when there's loss of cabin pressure, are beginning to pop out of the ceiling. People are screaming. My wife and family were together flying. I'm reading a newspaper. And my kids are there. And it was very, it was, it was bad. I mean, we saw the, the waves as the plane was coming down close to the ocean. The waves are all rising. We could see them. It was one of the worst storms we've ever entered into. And I have a newspaper and I'm reading it. People are screaming. There are people in the back of the plane calling us to go pray with them. It's just, we land safely, obviously, here I am. And just last year, my daughter, Anna, who was on that flight with us, said, Daddy, do you remember? I said, of course I do. She says, did you know I wasn't afraid? And I said, no, you know, honey, I never really have asked. You weren't afraid? She goes, no, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid. I said, really? Why? She says, I kept my eye on you. She said, if my dad got to be afraid, then I ought to be afraid. She said, I watched you when you were reading that newspaper calmly, just reading while people are screaming around you. She said, I knew that if you're not afraid, that I can trust that we'll be okay. Well, you know, that's just a human being. I obviously don't handle the weather or the plane or whatever because my other daughter said to me, Dad, why weren't you afraid? I said, because God's not through with our church. And I knew that. She said, did it ever occur to you that he doesn't need you <laughs> to do what he wants? And he said, no, I never really thought about that. Yeah, God doesn't need you to do what he wants to do in the church, Dad. I said, well, thanks for telling me after we landed. <laughs> Listen, guys, let me make one final application to you. Live in peace. Live in peace. God is in control. And listen, you die, okay, you die. Where do you go? Oh gosh, I have to go to heaven. Duh. Aren't you? <laughs> and I'm not making light of this, by the way. I'm really not. It can appear like I am, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making light of it at all. I understand those things. I do. I've ushered many people into the presence of the Lord. I understand that. What I'm saying is, what a waste of time to live in fear when Jesus is on your side. What a waste of time. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Who is this? What is this? He speaks with authority, and even the spirits are subject unto him. Who is this man? This is the Lord of glory. This is Jesus Christ. He's the king of the universe, and he's our Messiah. He is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, and he is the one who guards us. And so he already, through his teaching, has awakened them to his scriptural depth, and now they see his spiritual strength. And they're now left without excuse. Well, even so, later the city will ultimately reject him. Their amazement in the end was worthless because Capernaum as a city did not receive him. But it says finally in verse 28, immediately his fame began to spread throughout all the region around Galilee. The word of who Christ is gets out and others begin to hear of Jesus. When God is present, people show up. Somebody once said, catch fire. And people will drive from all around just to watch you burn. Catch fire for Jesus Christ. 
Catch fire for Christ. And people will see the glow of God's presence in your life. And they'll say, what is this? What is this? This is the transformation that comes. They're coming to faith in Christ. That's what this is. Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts. We ask that you would have your way in us. And that, Lord Jesus Christ, that we would value you for who you are. Lord, we only see a glimpse, a snapshot of the power that you possess. And there's so many things that we'll see as we go through Mark that will deepen these initial things that Mark presents to us. Your scriptural authority and your spiritual power. I just ask that we, the church, would awaken to it. Because even demons fear and tremble, and there are those who say, I believe in Christ, but in fact, they only believe in, in what they think he is, and they don't know him for who he is. I pray that we would know you for who you actually are. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would work in us today, and that, that Lord, we wouldn't just be those who, are, who have head knowledge and said faith, that we would actually have the real, the real thing, that we'd know you and be transformed by you. So I lift up this congregation, and I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we would live for you and serve you with all of our hearts every day, one day at a time. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some in this room who need to get right with the Lord right now. You may be watching online, you may be outside in an overflow, you could be in this room, and you need prayer, and you know it, and you need to be right with him. And if that's the case, I want to pray for you. And those whom I can see right now, if you need prayer, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you before I close this. Father, you see these hands. You know what's going on in these hearts and what these hands being raised represents. I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch each person whose hand is raised to you. Whatever that need may be, Lord, I pray that you would do what is right and help them, Lord, in this time of need. I especially pray that you would reach down, touch them in a way that their lives are forever changed because of who you are. So we lift these things to you now, and we ask in Jesus' name that you would answer this prayer to your glory. And we give you all praise, Lord, in your name, and we thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you would continue to move in all of us, and I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.